And so we're grateful for him, for his ministry, and the way that he serves here as uh, the director of financial aid. And so we know because he holds the money that he's one of your favorite people here at Clear Creek. And so we're going to be praying for him and, and uh, praying the Lord speaks through him. Sing and give strength to sing through our worship team today. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we love you, Lord. Oh, we're so thankful for you, for your presence in our life. We thank you for this place called Clear Creek for the impact that it's had on all of our ministry or that it is having at this present moment. We pray that you would be with uh, the worship of your name today. May your spirit just move in this place to the singing of your praises. Father, may you bless the preaching of your word. Give Brother Eddie the strength to stand and to preach your truth today that we could hear from you. Father, that it would stir in our hearts. And Lord, when I fail to praise you and to thank you for it all, in Jesus' name, amen. Please everybody stand and join us in praising our awesome God. When he rose up his sleeves, the angels put on the wrist. Our God is an awesome God. There is thunder in his footsteps and God is an awesome God. So right now we're just going to take a moment to, to pray to that awesome God, Lord, and lift up the many different concerns we have. We have midterms coming up, very stressful. All the other concerns of life, we have lost family members and friends that we want to lift up and allow, ask us, ask God to allow us to be a witness in their lives, Lord. So join me in prayer. Dear God, I thank you for this time that we can come together and worship you, Lord. I thank you for all the students who have accepted the call and are following in your will, Lord. Lord, please be with Brother Eddie as he brings the message here in a little bit. Speak through him and have your word said, not his, God. I thank you uh, 
for all the professors that are uh, willing to devote such time to, to furthering uh, the work of your, uh, of your great commission, God. And thank you once again for all your many blessings. In your precious son's name I pray, amen. that he took our sins to that old rugged cross and he gave us grace, grace so amazing. So sing with me about that amazing grace.
time that we can come here and worship you, Lord. I thank you for the amazing grace that you poured out upon me, a worthless wretch such as I. God, thank you for the mercy that you give to all lost sinners, Lord. Uh, be with Brother Eddie as he preaches the word. In your precious son's name I pray, amen. Amen. It is good to be back into chapel once again. And uh, very thankful for uh, Dr. Smith and Dr. Fox for granting me this privilege to be here. Uh, it's been about six years since I've got to step behind this pulpit. Uh, the last time was my senior chapel in 2014. Uh, very grateful once again for this opportunity. If you've got your scriptures, we're going to be in 1 Samuel chapter 27. 1 Samuel chapter 27 uh, as you're turning this way. And for us to really get into what we have going on here in this passage, we need to back up a little bit and get some idea of what's going on inside the life of David. So when we begin to think about David, uh, the first thing that I think about is uh, Scripture tells us that he is a man after God's own heart. And in fact, uh, 1 Samuel 13, 14, Saul has already uh, forsaken God, and, and Samuel comes in and he tells him, I have, you know, the Lord's taking the kingdom away from me, and he's seeking after the man after my own heart. So from that point forward, we're beginning to be introduced to the man of David. David, a man after God's own heart. I don't know about you, but that's an amazing testimony about somebody that's been being said, especially when that testimony comes from God Almighty Himself. So that is who we're talking about. And we come in and then we get to meet David in chapter 16. And when we meet him, he's getting anointed as king. We see Saul or Samuel comes in and uh, all the Jesse's boys are in there except for David. And finally they says, none of these is it. Where's there? Is there another one? He said, yeah, he's out in the sheep field, tending mouth out there. He said, well, bring him in. We ain't going to sit down until you bring the boy here. He brings him in and as soon as Solomon or, or Samuel sees him, he says, that's him. He gets up, he pours the oil over his head. He anoints him at that moment as the king. What an amazing story. And then we come on down to chapter 17, and we get in chapter 17, we see that this who David is and his real heart and his ferocity he has for God as he sees David and Goliath. 
he walks out to meet his brothers in the battlefield to check on everything going on. He sees the giant down there who is taunting Israel. He is taunting their God. And he says, I can't believe all you guys are going to sit around here and let this guy talk about my God like this. He says, I can't sit here and be like this. I'm going to go down there and I'm taking care of him because my God is able. This is who David is. We know that story real well, don't we? Saul says, here's my, my armor, here's my sword, here's everything you need. He says, I can't wear that. My God is able. And we know he goes down and he has this great conversation in 1 Samuel 17, verse number 45. It says, you come to me with a sword and a spear and with a javelin, but I come with you in the name of the Lord of hosts and the God of the armies of Israel whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand and I will strike you and take your head from you. And this day I will give the carcasses of the camp of the Philistine to the birds of the air and the wild beasts of the earth that the earth may know there is a God in Israel. I know one thing. David seems like a mighty man of God, doesn't he? I mean, he just seems like a guy that you just want to be around and want to follow. Of course... From here on out, we, we know in chapter 18, Saul's rivalry begins with David. In, in chapter 24, David spares Saul in the, in the cave of En Gedi. He goes up and he's hiding from, from Saul. And Saul comes in and he cuts the piece of his garments off. He goes out and said, Saul, I could have had you, but I am not going to touch the Lord's anointed. He said, you just go your way. I'll go my way. And Saul said, all right, that's good. In verse 25, things start to turn. In chapter 25, excuse me, Samuel dies. And that's a big turning point. Samuel dies in, in chapter 25. Chapter 26, uh, we see David sparing Saul once again. He actually walks into the middle of the camp while everybody's asleep. He takes uh, his spear and his water jug and he walks out. And he says, hey, Abner, you sorry dog, you. I just walked in here and I could have wiped out every one of you. But guess what? I'm not going to touch the Lord's anointed. You all just go on about your peace. And Saul says, David, is that my son? I'm sorry. You go on. You go your way, I'll go my way, and the Lord will be with you. So this is who we're talking about when we come here to chapter number 27. And all of a sudden here in chapter 27, we see something a little different. We see somebody whose heart is, is starting to get a little cold. He's starting to, to fear. He's starting to see a different side of David in this moment. If you would, stand with me as we read 1 Samuel chapter number 27. And we're just going to read the first couple of verses here this morning. In chapter 27, verse 1, it says, And David said in his heart, Now I shall perish someday by the hand of Saul. There is nothing better for me than that I should speedily escape to the land of the Philistine. And Saul will despair of me to seek me any more in any part of Israel. So I shall escape out of his hands. Then David arose and went with the, the 600 men who were with him to Achish, the son of Moab, king of Gath. Father, Lord, I, I ask today, Lord, that you speak to us this morning through your word. Father, I pray that you give me the words to speak that we as your people need to hear this very moment. Father, I pray that you help us to not lie to our own hearts that we may wander from you. Lord, I pray that you watch over us, you protect us. And Lord, I pray today if there's some here that need to come back, Lord, that you bring us to that place. Lord, God, we ask today in your son's name. In Jesus' name, and amen. You may be seated. I've titled the message this morning, Lies to the Heart. Lies to the Heart. I want you to look here in, in this verse, in, in verse number one. And the first thing we see here is, David said in his heart. He didn't run around to his 600 men and have a conversation. He didn't bring aside his two wives and have this conversation. He begins to have this conversation in his heart. And when we just look back in, in, in chapter 26, at the end of that, that's where he had just had the, his last conversation with Saul. 
Everything at that moment seems all right. But you know what? He's tired. He's weary. Things in his life look a little different. And all of a sudden, he says in his heart, I can't trust God anymore. I I can't live this life no more. He's been on the run for several years. He's had Samuel. His mentor is now gone. Everything in his life seems to be upside down and he begins to lie to himself that he cannot believe that the Lord was going to keep him anymore. Lies in our hearts make us forget. I ask you today, have you been lying inside your heart? Have you forgotten the promises of God? Have you forgotten the protection of God? Have you forgotten the power of God in your life? The very first thing that that David makes in this comment, he says, Now I shall perish someday by the hand of Saul. He has forgotten about the protection that God has given him his entire life. This is the same guy that says, I am not going to stand here while you guys let this guy talk about my God. I'm going after him. This is the same guy guy that has killed people or bears and lions and everything else to protect sheep. He has forgotten about the fact that God has protected him his entire life. Many times we get into places like Clear Creek and we come and we think, man, it's so hard here. I don't know how I'm going to make it here. It seems like I'm always broke. It seems like there's always something going on. There's attacks coming from every direction and we want to give up and we want to quit and we begin to lie to ourselves in our hearts and we begin to step away and we begin to forget about the protection that God has given us to get us to this place. We forget about what God has done for us in our past where He has protected us, watched over us, and given us all the grace and mercy that we have ever needed to get to where we are now. Yeah. And we lie, and we begin to be in, listen to that little voice in our ears that's saying, man, it would be easier. It'd be better for me to pack my bags and go home. You know what? It's midterms. A lot of you guys are going to say, it'd be better for me to pack my bags and go home. Don't listen to those lies. Don't listen to those lies. David has forgotten about the promises that God has made. You remember way back here, we already talked about this, in chapter number 16, when this guy comes in and dumps some oil on David's head. That was a very important moment for him. That was God establishing a promise for him that he was going to be the king of Israel. And Saul couldn't stop that no matter what. Saul couldn't kill David. It didn't matter. The best place that he could have ever been was right in the midst, in the teeth of Saul. That's where God had called him. God told him to stay in Judah. He had already been told, hey, David, I want you to stay right here in Judah and don't worry about what's going on with Saul. I want you to be right where I've told you to be at. Man, we can look sometimes and we, we can look afar and the grass looks real green over in Philistia. It, it's real nice and green and lush over there. They don't seem to have any problems. They don't seem to have any worries. Man, they look like they're having a, uh, just a ball and a blast over there. I, I think it's better over there, and, and I don't have to worry about the promises that God has made me, that He's going to keep me, that He's going to be with me. He's never going to leave me nor forsake me, and I don't have to worry about the fact that God has promised me that today is the day of salvation, and He has already saved me from my past, He has already saved me from my present, and He has already saved me from the future. There is nothing that my God has not already saved me from. David has forgot about his promise. He forgot he's the king of Israel. How about you today? Have you been listening to the, to the lies in your heart? Have you forgotten that you're a child of the one true king? Have you forgotten that he's called you to a royal priesthood? That he's begotten you as his son, that you have an inheritance waiting on you, that you're co-heirs with Jesus, and that if he's given us the son, what is it that he's going to hold back from us? Have we forgotten who he is? Well, David had forgot these things because he was listening to his own heart. He said he had this conversation in his heart. And here's the thing. Maybe I'm the only one, Dr. Fox, has these conversations in my heart. But you know what? I don't dare say these things out loud because I know people are going to come to me and say, you're stupid. You know better. Don't you dare. 
But we'll say them inside, and then all of a sudden we're gone. You know how we know that? There's some seats empty over here that didn't used to be. Faculty, staff, students all across the board. People began to listen to the lies. They forgot the, the protection of God, the promises of God, and the power of God. Man, David's not the only one that's ever gone through this, and neither are you. I mean, we can look at Scripture, and, and we think about Elijah. He calls down fire on top of Mount Carmel, and the next thing we know, we see him out in the desert whining because there's a woman over here in Israel that wants to kill him. Uh, we, we see all through Scripture people who are forgetting about the power of God in their lives. Have you forgotten about where God has brought you from? Have you forgotten about where He's brought you to? Have you forgotten? You know, I, I think back in my life and I think back of all the blessings that He's given me. I think about everything that He's done for me and I sit back in just all in amazement that He has chose to use me in any fashion. I'm so unworthy. I am so incapable. I, I by far am not the greatest speaker. But by the power of God, he has chosen and gifted and used each and every one that's in this room. David forgot the power of God, the protection of God, and the promises of God. And let me tell you, when we listen to the lies of our heart, we forget. We forget. When we listen to the lies of our heart, we also flee. We run away. How many times have we seen students, not just students who come to Clear Creek, but they flee from Clear Creek? How many times have we seen folks flee from ministry, flee from what God has called them to do, flee from the very place that they're supposed to be? Listen, there, there is no safer place to be in any part of the world than right where God has called you. And it doesn't matter if that's in the midst of the battlefield in Afghanistan. You're safer there than you are sitting in this pew right here if you're fleeing from the presence of God. David here in verse 2, look what he does. Then David arose and went over with 600 men who were with him to Achish, the son of Moab, king of Gath. I want you to think about this for a moment. David literally leaves the promised land where he was commanded to be at, right in the center of God's will, to go over to the pagans who are over here sacrificing their children. They're putting them through the fire of Moloch. They are absolutely attacking the people of God. There is nothing over there that is beyond the Philistines. And now he's saying, you know what? It's better for me to act and look and be like these guys than it is to be a child of God. Man, he, he begins to flee and he goes to the Philistines of all people, the, the people that have absolutely hated and despised him his entire life. And there he is. Sad thing is, David didn't go alone. When you flee, you're never the only casualty. When you run from God, you're never alone. David has 600 men with him and his wives. Listen, if you're here today and you're running from God and you're listening to the lies, it doesn't just affect you. It affects your family. It affects your church family. It affects your neighbors. It affects your witness. It affects every aspect of your life. It doesn't just affect you. It goes out in, in, into every area of your life. How many here have parents who are lost. Can you imagine what that testimony is going to be like? You flee from God? How many people here have lost children? Siblings? How many people here serve in churches? How many people here have neighbors you know? And let me tell you, when we flee from the presence of God in our life, we are destroying the testimony we have with them. We are diminishing the power of God in our life and we're saying that He's not good enough for us, so why would they be good enough for them? Lies to the heart don't just make us forget. They don't just make us flee. They make us fake. 
does this guy sound like the guy that was challenging Goliath? That was sparing Saul's life on multiple occasions? That had his best friend Jonathan die? I mean, does this sound like the guy that we had just read about? Does this sound like the guy that is the guy, the man after God's own heart? See, that's what's great about Scripture. It's God didn't hide this from us. He puts it out there for us to learn from. You know what? I've got scars all over me. Most of them are stupid scars. They're there for I can remember the pain and the hurts and everything, and I don't want to do that no more. I learned a lot of lessons for I, that hurt. The Lord leaves these in here for us to learn from because this hurts. Look here. David becomes unrecognizable as the man after God's own heart. In verse number 5, he actually goes down and talks to Achish, the king, and he says, I'm your servant. This is supposed to be God's man, God's servant, and he is now calling the pagan king Lord. We read down through verses 7 and we see that this didn't just happen for a day or a week. This was a 16-month period of David's life. And you know what's so sad about this 16 months? When we read through the Psalms and we read through all that he did, there's no Psalm written in this point in time. Dead silent. You know what? You can't flee from God and praise God. You, you can't run away from Him and say, Praise God! You can't be a witness for him while you're running away from him. And here for these 16 months, the man after God's own heart is dead silent when it comes to praising his God. We read through verses 8 through 12, and he becomes a land pirate. I mean, he's just going through and raiding villages and wiping them out, killing everybody in it. Man, woman, child, nobody's left behind because he don't want somebody to go rat him out to Achish. And he goes in, he takes all the critters, and he takes all the clothes, and he goes back. And this is God's, a man after God's own heart. And then we come down into chapter number 28. Look here in 28, verses 1 and 2, and it says, Now it happened in those days that the Philistines gathered their armies together for war to fight with Israel. And Achish said to David, You assuredly know that you will go out with me to battle you and your men. So David said to Achish, Surely you know what your servant can do. And Achish said to David, Therefore I will make you one of my chief guardians forever. David is aligning not only to go to war, but to go to war with God's people. He is now saying, You know what, Achish? I'll be your number one man. You know what my men are capable of. You know how we're able to fight. Let's go. He is lined up to go to war with the Philistines against the Israelites. Now, we know when we read through here that that's not going to happen. The rest of the Philistines don't trust him, and they send him packing on home. But David had no reservations. He was ready not only to stand opposed to God's people, but to war against God's people. Let me tell you, you flee from God long enough, you're going to be battling the very people you used to call brothers and sisters. You're going to stand opposed to everything that you once were. You're going to be such a fraud and such a fake that nobody's going to trust you. All this brings us to this place, doesn't it? David, as we read through here, we can come on through and we can see that in, in 28, as we read through the, the first Samuel, we know that this is a contrast between Saul and, and David. And so in, we go through the rest of 29 and we see that the, we have the Saul going to the median and we, we know that the, the war is getting ready to wage and they send David home. David's on his way home, but as he was on his way home, we find that the Amalekites have invaded Ziglag, the city that he was given, and have taken everybody captive that he left behind. They took all of his stuff. He's been raided, just like what he's been doing for the past 16 months in his life. Now that's happened to him. And he comes to this place, and now he is broken. He, he recognizes his mistakes. And the greatest thing about the loss of your heart is that they can be forgiven. But we got to 
be the ones who are making the steps. Listen, look over here in chapter number 30. He comes back to Ziglag. He sees everything's burnt. His wives are gone. All the men's families are gone. In verse number 6, uh, Now David was greatly distressed for the people spoke of stoning him because the soul of all the people were grieved. Every man for his sons, his daughters, but David strengthened himself in the Lord his God. Then David said to, to Abathur the priest, Abimelech's son, please bring me the ephod to me. And Abathur brought him the ephod to David, and David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I purpose, pursue the troops, shall I overtake them? David had to come all the way back to nothing, to be broken, to recognize his faults. But once David did, there's three things that David does here that I'm going to ask you this morning if that's something that you have done or need to do. First of all, David strengthened himself in the Lord. That was the very first thing he did. For 16 months, he's not spoke to the Lord. For 16 months, he's not sung him. For 16 months, he's been going through the motions as the king of his little rebels. 16 months, he is not sought after God. 16 months, finally God comes and he breaks him, brings him to this place. He says, I'm tired of you lying to yourself. I'm tired of you being this who you are not, being this fake man that I don't want you to be. And let me tell you, everybody in here, if you've not been down this trail, you're blessed. I've gone down this road. I've had this battle, and I'm very thankful that all that David had to do was recognize who God was, and he began to strengthen himself in the Lord. So what does it look like to strengthen yourself in the Lord? Well, for the past 16 months, he strengthened himself in himself, and he completely looked like a fake and a fraud. He wasn't the man he was supposed to be. But now, all of a sudden, he strengthens himself. He recognizes the power of God. He recognizes the promises of God. He recognizes the Spirit of God in his life. And he comes and he calls for the the, the ephod and the priest. You know what that tells us? That tells us that the ephod and the priest was with him the whole time. They were always there. He just wasn't seeking him. And God has always been with us, even on these journeys, even though we wasn't seeking Him. He's still there. Listen, we got to strengthen ourselves and seek after the Lord in His presence. And as soon as He has sought for the Lord, He comes and He begins to ask the Lord for guidance. He begins to beg for the Lord and say, Lord, what shall I do? Where shall we go? And the direction was given Him. Now I tell you today, you may be here today and you may be saying, what is it I need to do? I have straight away... I I have had these lies in my life for so long, I I begin to believe them. Now, I'm ashamed to say that I I, I won't even speak these lies out out loud to to my coworkers or to my friends or to my wife or my kids or or anything about that. But I've got these, these, these doubts in my life that I have just let in there and drive wedges and separate me from God. And I just keep driving. I don't believe David one day just stood up and walked away from God. I believe he let those voices... Slowly get a little deeper and a little deeper until they hit the core of his heart. And once those voices got into his heart, his heart fled from God. James tells us that the sin begins as a little seed. And then we take it and we let it get watered and then we fertilize it. And pretty soon we see it full bloom, the fruit of our sin. David's sin didn't start in Ziglag. David's sin started when he began to listen to the lies. Today, maybe you just need to refresh your mind. Strengthen your hold in the Lord Jesus Christ today. Maybe today is the day that you come back to a place where you recognize His power and His promises in your life. One of my favorite scriptures is Psalm 51, 5110. And it was wrote after another one of, of David's great mishaps, after he had been with Bathsheba. 
And David has to come clean and all that. And finally he comes out and he says, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Don't try to fix what's here, God. It's broken, it's nasty, and it's filthy. Create. I need a brand new heart. I need something that only you can do, and I need your power to do that in me. You know, I like to read scriptures, and and I kind of like to do uh, what what, uh, Marvel's doing now, you know, with the whole new What If series, and and they go in, they change. What if something was different? What if this... And so when I read through 1 Samuel, I like to what if a lot of things. What if Saul would have never stepped away from God. Can you imagine what a, a, an amazing country and people that would have been if he would have led the people in the way that God had commanded it? Man, we would read a completely different scripture. We wouldn't even know the name of David. What if, what if even after Saul has committed his, his sins and, and David is brought onto the scene and, and Saul decides that he's going to repent? And he brings David along to be the greatest general that he has ever had in his life. Can you imagine the conquest that Saul and David would have had? Man. And then when David comes on the throne, Jonathan would have been the greatest commander for David. Man, can you imagine that? And guess what? We would never have heard the name Solomon. What if, what if you could turn back time? And you could go back to that time when you begin to listen to those voices before you let them in your heart. Would it be a different story for you? Well, this is what we know. I ain't got no time machine. But I got a fantastic Savior. I can't go back. The only place I can ever go back to is the place of the cross. So what if today you don't try to go back? You just come to the cross and to the foot of Calvary. Say, Lord, create in me a new heart. And then from this day forward, We don't worry about the what ifs. We just go with who he is. My God is good. My God is gracious. My God is great. My God is amazing. And I'm just so old-fashioned, Dr. Smith, that I can't preach the word without an invitation. So I'm going to ask one of you guys to come play on the piano or something. And I believe that every time that the word is preached that we should have time to respond to that. And whether you need to come forward and and to the altar and pray, that's fine. Whether you just need to sit quietly at your seat and pray, that's fine. But whatever you need to do, I ask you today, is there a spot in your life, is there a place that you've been listening to, the lies in your life, that right now you're saying, Lord, I'm tired of it, I'm going to strengthen in you, and I'm returning today. No more what ifs, just right now. No more. Here I am. Will you come? Do what you need to do. Father, Father, Lord God, we thank you for the day. Lord God, I thank you for your word, for your grace, for who you are. And Lord, we're just so thankful today that we don't have to listen to the lies that we speak in our own hearts. Today, Lord God, I pray that you change us And create in us, Lord God, a new heart. That, Lord, we can leave this place serving you, praising you for who you are. Lord God, I love you and all that's here. And, Lord, I ask this. Jesus' name, amen. Come pray. Whatever you need to do, whatever's on your heart.